First of all, I would uh, like to invite uh, the two panelists to, to comment on uh, each other's uh, in, in, in intervention uh, and ask them to keep in mind that we would also like to have uh, room for questions from the, 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 the audience. But uh, I'll give uh, the floor first to uh, Huao uh, to, to comment on what you have heard so far. Well, um, there's probably two topics that, uh, that <laughs> I'd like to comment on um, uh, with the preliminary note. The, the, the preliminary note is the one that I made as well in my presentation, is that uh, we do, even, even when, we, when we, let me speak in more political terms, even when we don't like what we see, the worst thing would be not to see anything. So the fact that OECD is providing us with data on a regular basis is, is very important to make this shift that is progressively being done in many countries of doing evidence-based policy. Uh, and, uh, and for that, to have independent evidence is, uh, is very, very uh, important for, for us to take the role of, of making decisions. Uh, then the, the other point I'd like to make, and this is a bit uh, sharing what we were discussing over lunch, mm. is this issue of the 20 or 40 year reforms and the political cycles. I think this is really something important for everyone. Uh, I remember in one of the previous 2030 meetings we had in Paris, there was a small focus group with an expert on public policies and on impact of, of reforms. And she made a very interesting uh, presentation with a, a, a diagram of how the world should work in terms of the design of a, policy, of a public policy, the follow-up, the monitoring, the evaluation, the impact, all this. And she kept saying the big problem for the model is the politicians and the political cycles. And I, I, I felt I had to defend <laughs> the politicians in there. And I said, look, maybe it's the model that is wrong. Because uh, for two reasons. One is we know the regular calendar of political cycles is normally four or five years in, in different countries. So if we have a model that does not take this piece of evidence into consideration, it's an incomplete uh, model. And the other thing is about uh, life in democracy. Let me give you my own example. I came, I got invited to be a member of the government because I fully disagreed with the measures on education from the previous government. So don't ask me to be just doing the current management of policies that I think are uh, basically wrong. So, and, and this is why the government changed, because in different sectors there were uh, different views. So it's legitimate and expectable that these this changes appear. Now, this, this is a conflict. Uh, this is a conflict, and I think we need uh, our academy to also help policymakers how to reconcile uh, this conflict. So these were the two uh, main comments uh, that popped out in my mind. When I was Lars? Yeah, um, I certainly agree that, that independent research and independent uh, uh, um, high quality um, research, which is at the same time relevant and close to, to practice, is very important. Uh, I, of course, I, I should say so as, as a researcher. But, uh, but also, we have to add that, uh, that I think the most ideological area of, of research at, the, at any university is education research. Um, so uh, what I shouldn't say is uh, don't always uh, uh, don't always uh, listen to, to, to all researchers because <laughs> <laughs> of course they also have sort of a, uh, a message to, to, to send. But, but I think the, the most inter interesting uh, relationship between what you said and what, what I've experienced is you know, the different languages of, of, of politics and, and, uh, and research that um, 
you have had your four years period. Uh, you had a right wing government. Now you have a center left government. And of course, for for ideological reasons, uh, you had to change uh, the, the, the educational program uh, of, of the former government. We have the the same situation, just the opposite way. You know, from a from a left wing middle government to a to a liberal conservative government. Uh, but we have had the same same results. And uh, I think that uh, if you know a more balanced relationship between uh, what we actually know as researchers and what uh, uh, politicians want to do, uh, a better balance would, would be would be good. Uh, we always try not to talk about expert-based policies and practices, but on expert-informed politics mm -hmm. and, uh, and and practices because. Uh, you have also ideological. You 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 want to do something with with uh, with your educational system, um, and and uh, and that's something that part of ideology. We cannot sort of um, uh, there. You have to 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 listen to yourself and not to researchers. Well, I agree. We, we cannot solve the issue of uh, uh, the research cycle being out of sync with the, the political science and uh, with the, uh, the cycle of implementation of, of, of reform. But, but what we could do, uh, I believe, is, is actually to uh, uh, deliberately build up some fora where we could discuss these matters uh, in an open atmosphere. Imagine if we had succeeded in actually bringing some parliamentarians uh, in, in here, then we would have uh, researchers uh, um, policy makers and uh, representatives from the teacher community in the same room uh, overhearing the, the same messages and uh, dis discussing the, the, the same matters uh, that, that that is uh, my idea, my big idea i have tried to pursue it in education 2030 with the result that uh, it has grown to to be an almost uh, well uh, a community beyond control. <laughs> it's a really a, a challenge being a chairman in, in, in that community, I, I, I can tell you. Uh, but, but that was the idea to have researchers, policymakers, and professionals in the same room, overhearing the same messages, discussing what are the meaning of this, and uh, maybe take this further, who will do what in, in, in the next steps as we move ahead. But now I'd like to take uh, questions and comments uh, from, from the audience um, to what we have heard uh, in the in the, this afternoon's session. Yep. Well, uh, again, uh, probably I will be the one taking the critical stance here. Uh, I'm wondering because right now I'm, I've been asked to have uh, to make lectures about global citizenship, and uh, all over the world, actually. Hong Kong, Malaysia, in Denmark, in Copenhagen, and so on. Uh, so for that reason, I have studied the UNESCO programs a lot. And what I see there is a, a slightly different way of looking at education also. So what UNESCO emphasizes is dignity, uh, social justice, we have to take care of the society, we have to take care of the world. We have to, so in a much more like the UN, much more a different terminology than the terminology I hear here. So I wonder, moral education, such kind of things. So I wonder, could you kind of elaborate a bit about the OECD approach uh, compared to an, an a UNESCO approach towards global education, because as I hear you kind of wanting to have an impact on the global world education system. Yeah, actually one of the things I like, I like about this uh, change in OECD that uh, you all mentioned before is that we this, this difference between the UNESCO uh, Declaration on Education and the, the, the past that OECD was following in the last decades, I think, is diminishing. So, um, and sometimes uh, for me, it's difficult to tease apart 
what comes from each, uh, each uh, organization because the borders are really, really disappearing. And if you, if you this, this difficult schema that both Andres and I showed, uh, if it has as the main goal of all this project to promote well-being. And if, if you were discussing well-being, you're necessarily discussing dignity. And actually, one of the difficult topics in the 2030 project, and also for us in Portugal, uh, in the implementation of, of this new curriculum, is that when we talk about competence, the notion of competence that was designed in the project, and also for us, uh, uh, is a mix between uh, knowledge, uh, skills, attitudes, and values. And, and that's where the discussions across countries become uh, very difficult because we need to uh, make sure that when we discuss values, we are always discussing uh, the same things. And, uh, and I remember in one of the meetings, one country presenting the issue on values saying, yeah, we introduced ethnical identity in the first grade. And I thought, well, it's better not to have values in the curriculum then. But, uh, but yeah, so I, I don't think there is a big difference right now on the up, on the on 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 the opposite side i actually think that there is a convergence for the first time in in many years uh, i can also add that we have delegates uh, from uh, from unesco taking part in the education 2030 meetings and uh, we we take a lot of uh, the stuff on board that has been developed in unesco like the sustainable development goals and uh, all these so so it's diminishing. I should not say that it's not there, but uh, we, are, we are making the gap narrow. The last do you have? Yeah, I, 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 first of all, I would, I would support uh, this message that, uh, that uh, the, the picture of, of, of the image of OECD as the economists uh, in, in the right wing of the room and the UNESCO people as the soft uh, people in the in left wing of, uh, uh, part of the room is, is, is not true anymore. Uh, there's much more similarity than, than differences here. But I would add, add to that that, uh, that exactly the example of global citizenship, uh, I have sort of explored that at a, at a very local level because I've been part of uh, uh, the curriculum development of a Danish gym gymnasium, a Danish high school, uh, which has a global citizen program as, as the headline of, of, of the program. And there we have involved, uh, well, we have, have discussed normative issues, cognitive issues, skills issues, uh, attitude issues, etc. We have involved sociologists, educational researchers, we have involved representatives of, of uh, major social interest groups, uh, politicians, of course, but also teachers and students. Uh, and I think that is just an example of what I tried to say before, that the curriculum process today is much different from what it used to be 20 years ago. And I think this is the important message, that uh, we have a new model, we have to refine this new model, and uh, if we could also practice it in, 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 in a Danish uh, uh, folk school context, it would, be, it would be very, very nice and interesting. Uh, thank you. We have a question from Christina. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Christina. Is it on? Yeah. My name is Christina Aldrin. And I'm from the Danish Teacher Trade Union's Brussels office. Uh, first of all, I have two comments to you, Lars. Um, it seems like, uh, <laughs> but maybe I misunderstood you, that you understand uh, um, comparative education as something which started with the PISA. And uh, I mean, you have had two Winter Jensen here at the university for many years, and he has been conducting, uh, conducting a, a comparative education for many, many decades. Um, so that's one thing. It didn't start with PISA. Uh, the second thing is that, that I think you overemphasize uh, the output-oriented curriculum development in the Education 2030 project. In my understanding, this is much more about developing innovative learning environments, much more than only just looking at uh, an output-oriented curriculum. And then uh, the last thing I would like to quote uh, from the Slicer's book, The World Class, and ask both of you the opinion, your opinion on, on this quote, and also what this means both politically and, and, uh, and in practice in schools. And he's, he writes, when teachers feel a sense of ownership over their classrooms, when students feel a sense of ownership over their learning, that is when productive teaching takes place. So the answer is to strengthen trust, transparency, 
professional autonomy and the collaborative culture of the profession all at the same time. So what do you think this means both politically and, uh, and for the schools? Thank you. Thank you, Christina. First, last, then, uh, well. Well, first of all, you know, I think that, uh, well, you also mentioned that as, 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 a, as a possibility that you misunderstood my message. Perhaps I wasn't clear enough. I, of course, I didn't say that it, comparative education or it, uh, comparative education research started with, uh, with PISA. Uh, that would be uh, untrue and nonsense. What I try to say is that uh, in, in, in Denmark, and we have a, a living example of that, it started with, with, the, with, the, uh, with the Pearl's shock, uh, um, and it, it then grew with the, with the, with the PISA uh, influence. And uh, what I meant was not you know, that we didn't uh, talk about comparative education, but that uh, in a, in a, in a, you know, on, on the front pages of the newspapers, in the in the understanding of of, uh, of, of citizens in Denmark, uh, th these results from PISA and from the IEA studies actually changed the sort of the opinion making process in in Denmark, and I'm I'm pretty sure that that is true. Um, secondly, uh, no, of course um, um, the the. Um, uh, the, 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 the process of curriculum development uh, isn't, uh, isn't uh, just an output-oriented process, but the point is that we start with the, the, the major, the global or the major, the national, uh, the international um, challenges and needs, uh, and, and we have to identify that in a much better way, in a much have a much be, uh, deeper understanding of that before we actually go on to the sort of more traditional curriculum development process. And that was sort of what I tried to say that uh, that uh, we should start in another place and we should involve other people, uh, other experts than just uh, the politicians and the education uh, researchers. Uh, thirdly, uh, the. Uh, issue of ownership um, and trust, there we actually totally agree. Um, what I emphasized very much was the necessity to, to uh, support the professional level and uh, identity of teachers' work. Um, one way of doing that is to create much more teamwork, much better teamwork facilities, uh, professional learning communities as we call it nowadays, uh, and one of the points with, uh, with, uh, with teamwork facili facilities is that you actually combine the issue of autonomy with the uh, issue of, of collaboration. Uh, we try to, we, we normally uh, make a distinction between uh, professionalism from uh, outside and professional professionalism from inside. And I think it's very important that professionalism uh, and the development of the profession comes from inside from the work of teachers, not only, only as teachers in the classroom, but as teachers working together, developing their competences, uh, creating uh, uh, experiments, etc. Uh, and, and that is how we should finance that is another issue. You can fight for that. Yeah, um, basically seconding this, but then from the more political side. Um, the, yeah, so I definitely agree with the statement that this sense of ownership is, is crucial for, for the effective learning and effective teaching to take place. And then the question is how, on the political side, this can be induced and promoted, right? Uh, what we tried to do in the construction of this, of this set of policies was, on the teacher's side, uh, to involve teachers, uh, to have teachers in our, our focus groups in the in the groups that that created the, the these 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 documents and these designed these policies. Of course, this is always um, then it's politics, right? It's no longer policy; it's politics. So, if I invite 50 teachers, I have other 50 telling why them and not us. So, this is this is part of how these things uh, uh, work. But um, also, <clears throat> what we've been trying to do is to be very close to school, to schools. So we go a lot to the schools to discuss face-to-face uh, uh, -face with, the, with the school headmasters, with the, the, the school teachers uh, in general. So there's this word of engagement that is, 
that is very, uh, very important. The other thing is to show, uh, to show to everyone that a change in, in, uh, in education is possible. And for this, this uh, uh, we, we've been organizing uh, uh, dozens and dozens of seminars across the country in which we invite schools to show their practices. Uh, because this is very, very effective. Uh, it, it values the, the teachers and their work, and it also shows its colleagues, telling other colleagues that things, uh, that things are possible. Now, there are, there are severe limitations and obstacles. Uh, one is that besides these policies, there's all kinds of inf infrastructural things, careers, uh, salary freezes, and all that. And this, there's always the risk of contamination, and uh, it's there. Uh, it's there. There's, as I mentioned during the presentation, we have in Portugal a huge tradition of centralization. Everything was dis decided by the ministry. Um, so giving schools the freedom to act takes time because it's a completely different uh, state of affairs. And, and that is also interesting because Schools claim for autonomy, but when we give them autonomy, they are afraid to use it because of this centralized tradition. Mm -hmm. will, will it not be the case that there will be someone from the ministry say that this, this measure that I took is, is actually not possible? So there's this tradition of asking, uh, of asking permission. And then, as was also mentioned before, we have very low practices, very low percentage of practices of uh, actual collaboration inside the school. Uh, the teachers uh, uh, teaching together, participating in the discussion of each other's materials and so on. And this is also a, a, a cultural shift. On the side of the students, what we did was uh, to create this student voice movement to also involve them in, in, uh, in, uh, in the, in the decision-making process. Uh, to address two issues in, uh, in, the, in the laws that we are passing and passing this message to schools. One is that students have to know what they are expected uh, to learn uh, from the very beginning of the school year. And sometimes they know that they have two tests to make in each term, but they don't actually know what are the questions that they will find answers during the school year. So this also takes time. This also takes uh, a, a different uh, way of addressing. The other thing is motivation. Uh, when we talk about these equity issues, we are talking many times about what people say, those students who do not want to be in school. And we have to ask them why they do not want to be in school and the, what are the strategies to motivate these, uh, the, these, uh, these students. And finally, participation. Uh, we, this, this, this article in the law that invites schools to create these regular uh, uh, opportunities for students to speak are, 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 are very important. And we also had a, it's, it's a program, but it's once a year we, we launched a participatory budget for students in schools. So one portion of the budget of schools is to be used and decided and voted in assembly uh, uh, upon proposals by the students. And they feel that they take part in the construction of the, of the school ecosystem. This is, although it's a one day thing with one month before of preparation, of projects to be voted. It's very, very important in terms of what this, uh, this conveys. And then in the 2030 project, uh, there's this, as Jorn was saying, there's this participation of many stakeholders and the word agency is one of the words in the project. So student agency, teacher agency, exactly because we know that this is a critical aspect of uh, all this change. Uh, thank you. Uh, I had another uh, request for, for a, a question, but unfortunately we have uh, already been, been easing of your time, so I'll ask you, Heidi, could you put the question in during the coffee break? Uh, thank you. Thank you for your understanding. Uh, I told you that I will be um, brutal and unfair, uh, and uh, I have already stolen a quarter an hour of your coffee break, and you won't have it back. Um, you will, uh, we will reconvene again five minutes past, so you'll have 20 minutes of coffee break. Uh, I hope it's uh, okay with you. Thank you. And thank you for the panelists. <laughs>